Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cheryl Mangan, the Research Manager from Autism CRC, and I'd like to welcome you today from, to today's webinar from the Education Research Program. This is the third webinar in our Autism Month webinar series. Autism CRC is working to build capacity and develop appropriate educational environments and programs for social, behavioural and academic success. Working with students, parents, school systems, teachers and health professionals, we're developing programs and resources to support children to succeed at school and beyond. Today, Dr Dawn Adams will be providing an update on the Autism CRC's landmark longitudinal study of students on the autism spectrum. The aim of the study is to determine the relationship, if any, between child and family characteristics, their experiences of intervention and school support and child and developmental and behavioural trajectories. Before we get started, we'd just like to go over a few items to help you participate best in today's webinar. You are listening in your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to Dawn by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. Dr Dawn Adams is a senior lecturer at the Autism Centre of Excellence at Griffith University. She moved to Australia from the UK last year where she was working at the University of Birmingham with Professor Chris Oliver. Her research interests focus upon the interaction between behaviour and mental health in young people on the autism spectrum and those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Being a qualified clinical psychologist, Dawn is passionate about translating research into practice and regularly presents research findings to parents and clinicians in Australia and Europe. Before I hand over to Dawn, can I just remind you to please write your questions to Dawn throughout the webinar. We'll be compiling these at the end for a Q&A session following the presentation. Over to you, Dawn. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for um, attending this seminar, which I'm going to update you on the longitudinal study, which has been undertaken now in its uh, for the last two years, which is the longitudinal Australian study of students with autism. And this is hosted um, at Griffith University in the Autism Centre of Excellence, along with a range of collaborators. And the project's led by Professor Jackie Roberts, um, and I've put her contact details there in case anyone has uh, any questions afterwards they'd like to discuss with her. So this is our team at the Autism Centre of Excellence, just to give you a bit of uh, context of where the study is being run. So Jackie Roberts here is our um, director of the Autism Centre, and she's a speech and language therapist by background. And she teaches really um, and focuses on communication and strengths within the um, cohort of children with autism we're looking with. Professor Deb Keane is another professor within our department, and she has an ed dev psych background. And she really, her research really focuses on assessment and early intervention and how we can ensure engagement and participation throughout um, children's educational experience. Uh, then we've got me, and I've come over from the UK, as Cheryl said. I have a clinical psychology background, um, and I've got a sort of real interest in um, behaviour and parental adjustment to behaviour and how it interacts with outcomes. And we've got Kate Simpson, who is an occupational therapist by background, and she's got a strong research focus on participation involvement and engagement. So as you can see, we all come from a broad and diverse background with speech and language pathology, occupational therapy, ed dev psychology and clinical psychology. And this has really enabled us to kind of approach this study with all these areas in mind and bring research and results together to try and inform a multidisciplinary approach. 
So what I want to cover today is really tell you a bit about the LASA. So I'm going to tell you what the LASA is and why it's set up in this way. Um, I'd like to explain why we're doing the same measures over and over again because I think that's what some people wonder. Why am I answering the same questions over and over? Um, I'll explain to you who we're asking for information and from that what we're hoping to find out. I'll update you on where we're at so far and a couple of the results from some of the research papers we've submitted so far and then what we plan to do next. And if you've got any other questions, um, you can type them into the chat box and we'll come to them at the end. Um, or any questions afterwards, you can email the address at the beginning. So what is the LASA? The LASA, um, as Cheryl said, its aim is to determine the relationship, if any, between child and family characteristics, um, the child and family's experiences of intervention and school support, and the child's developmental and behavioural trajectories. Now, within that, we're really interested in um, things like participation, because this is some of the developmental trajectories, so children's engagement and participation at school. The LASA team is made up of a large number of people, um, some of whom I just introduced you to, Professor Roberts and Professor Keane, Dr Simpson and myself. We have Jess Painter, who's a psychologist um, at Griffith and the Gold Coast, Marlene and David, who are speech and language pathologists, and the amazing Robin Garland, who you will know if you are involved in the study, um, is our research coordinator and communicates with parents and schools, principals, pretty much everyone to keep us all on track. And because this sort of research isn't possible just with a group of researchers, we have a large number of partners, which include Amata Children's Hospital, um, Royal Children's Hospital, Sydney Children's Hospital, Aspect, AEIU, and of course the Department of Education who help us collect a lot of the information from schools, principals and teachers. So that's what the LASA is. But why is it set up this way? Why do we want to conduct a study for this number of years, but again and again using the same measures? So this is a longitudinal study, which means it's conducted over a period of time. And what we're going to do is we've got two cohorts of children. So if we focus here on the baseline, in 2015, when the, the children were first recruited into the study, the younger cohort were aged four to five, and the older cohort were aged nine to 10. And then we're gonna collect information on them every year as they go through primary and secondary school, right into 2020, when that's the last data collection point. Now, why do we want it set up this way? Well, there's surprisingly little longitudinal data on children with autism and their educational experience. So by collecting the same measures on the same children over time, we can see and plot that child's trajectory, so their progress on different measures as they get older. And we can do this for children who were four when they began and when they were nine when they began. We can also explore the cross-sectional cohort effects, so by this, we could explore what it was like to be a 9 to 10 year old with autism in 2015 and then fast forward into the future we can explore what it's like to be a 9 to 10 year old with autism in 2020. And because we'll have the same measures at 2015 and 2020 it allows us this comparison to say has anything changed for a child aged 9 to 10 with autism in these two between 2015 and 2020? And if yes, what? And if no, sort of begin to look into why not? But in the meantime, we have lots of things we can do as well. So for using, this is the first data collection point, we can compare the data on things like behavior or anxiety in children who are four to five to those who are nine to 10 as well, and see if there's a difference in age on many of these factors. And of course we can do that at each time point as we go through. 
So we can compare one child across a series of years. We can compare the, uh, the same age children at different points in time. And we can also compare different age children at the same point in time. So that sounds quite complicated, and it is, and there's a lot of comparisons we're going to do across the time. But it helps us to get lots of different research questions asked from one large study. So who are we asking for information in this study? Who are we collecting it from? Well, the largest piece of information is coming from the parents who are providing us information on the child and the family setup. So we're looking at measures of child participation, and by that we mean how often a child engages in a range of activities and how involved they are when they're doing those activities. So someone might do an activity every day, such as um, self-care, but the level of involvement that a child have may differ. So for example, you may be putting on a, a child's um, socks for them or getting them dressed. They're doing that task every day, but actually their level of involvement is low. Whereas a child who dresses themselves, a parent would rate the level of involvement as high. We have measures of things like adaptive behaviour. Now that's uh, our way of describing things like uh, language skills, uh, social skills, um, being able to adjust to changes in the environment, um, self-care skills. We would expect to see those change as and develop as children age and get older. And we want to know how those link really with changes and developments at school. We're looking, at, unsurprisingly, because we've, Professor Roberts is a speech and language pathologist, we've got measures of communication. So we're interested to see if a child's communication and their communication skills and development links in with their academic outcomes for school. Because there are two psychologists on the team as well, there are measures of behavioural problems and behavioural presentations and mental health in the form of anxiety. Because a child exists within the family and there's lots of interesting things within the family, we've got measures of family history, so um, who's in the family, the sort of support available to the family and the interventions accessed. We have measures of parent stress, which is highly reported in autism to be elevated. So we really want to find out sort of what are the factors that lead to that and does that change over time. And we have measure of family outcome. So this is how, um, how a family operate as a unit and um, the strengths of that and the things that they find difficult. So you can see this is why the parent questionnaire pack is so large because we're taking all these measures um, over these periods of time um, so we can see if these things change and if so how and why. But we're also asking the teachers and principals at school to complete questionnaires and give us information on things such as a child's academic skills. So we've standardised questionnaires to ask about these to see how they develop over time. Um, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire which looks at things that the child has strengths in and things that children, lots of children find difficult and see if those profiles interact with the academic outcomes and if they're ever, the strengths are ever used to enhance the academic outcomes. And we've also got some data on what we kind of call the autism friendliness of the school. So the, the supports that are in place as standard and those are specific to the child. And that can include things like transitions in, support for teachers within the classroom, support for children um, in playtimes or out in the playground. And um, we're trying to get a measure of how adapted that school is or how sort of tailored that school is to autism and whether that helps the academic outcomes and the behaviour profile we see at school. So why would we collect all of these measures? What kind of things do we hope to find out? So I told you the overall aim of the study, but actually we have smaller questions below that aim, which fall into three broad categories, which we hope to get more information on. So focusing on sort of child participation and um, 
engagement at school. So one of the questions that we've, we really wanted to know was what does participation at school look like for children with autism? What activities are they engaged in? How frequently, how involved are they engaged in those? And is that the same or different than children without autism or children with um, intellectual disability, for example, where other researchers have used the same measures so we can compare to different groups of people? And then because we're taking the same measures over time, we can begin to ask questions like, how does child participation at school change over time? So do the um, engagement in specific activities improve over time or are there activities which children with autism continue to participate in less even as they get older? Within the education area, we want to know what sort of supports are available for children with autism and which ones do they access? And how do these impact on attainment or educational participation? And are these at the levels that we would expect, um, given the data we have on children without autism? And then there's a the big area looking at child outcomes. So what can we find out about behaviour, anxiety, language and social skills? Um, how do these change over time? How do they impact on education? So for example, over time, we'll be able to pick out the children who are perhaps have a top 25% of uh, highest anxiety scores and 25% lowest anxiety scores and see what their educational um, attainment is over time and see if they differ. So that's a really good thing about having all these measures that you can start to ask these questions um, and say what happens to these subgroups of children over time as well as what happens to these, you know, what is a broader profile of all these children um, for that age over time. So what have we done so far within the study? So now we're in the beginning of year three. So we have time one and time two data. So at time one, we had brilliant recruitment. We were really pleased with how many parents um, engage with us. So we had 132 um, four to five year olds complete the question, parents of four to five year olds complete the questionnaire when um, online for us. And we had 140 nine to ten year olds. And as you can see, we've, we've got a fairly representative proportion of girls based on current figures. So about one in five of our participants in each cohort are girls. So we can use the data over time to explore the profiles of boys and girls differently if we if these girls stay in the group for us for a whole time, but also we can explore it as a whole for the, the larger cohort. And there's some really interesting things just when you look at the profiles of the people who agreed to participate in the first data collection point. So almost everyone's diagnosis was made or confirmed by a paediatrician, which obviously makes sense given the um, sort of requirements um, in some areas. Um, but when you look at who else uh, made the it, a diagnosis or confirmed, it's really interesting to see the split. So obviously some people um, have had, because these add up to more than 100%, obviously some people had more than one professional involved in their diagnosis. I was really interested actually in this group of people who 21% either made or so 21% of children had a diagnosis made or confirmed by their general practitioner. Now I started to look a little bit at this um, group of children here and look at their behaviour profile and when you compare this group of children to all the other children actually these children's behaviour levels are much um, disruptive behaviour is much more elevated and that made me wonder if the GPs are sort of picking up the very um, sort of children with lots of behaviour problems, so the more kind of clear cut cases that um, and then, than some of the other cases. So this is definitely a, something I'd like to look at a bit more in the future. But obviously we've got psychologists involved in speech and language, occupational therapists and, and it's only a small proportion going to psychiatry. So this will be an interesting area to follow up to, 
to see what happens with these profiles over time. When we split the household income, we can see that we've got a lot of um, families in a, a disproportionate amount, really, of families in a higher income bracket. So we'll really need to bear that in mind when we analyse our data, especially access to interventions. And whilst this is unsurprising, given the um, literature highlighting the elevated mental health difficulties and stress experienced by parents of children with autism, actually, one almost one third of our sample, the main caregiver uh, disclosed that they'd be diagnosed with a mental health difficulty. And obviously that will have impacts really on um, on future kind of um, participation. We need to make sure we, we find ways that people can engage even if they're going through difficult times. But also that might be something we need to explore a bit more about um, does this sort of statistic influence um, access to intervention or engagement and participation and maybe in a positive way or maybe in a way that um, actually gives us case for um, understanding this, this kind of statistic with a bit more action. So as well as all that parent data I just explained, we've got teacher data for, we had principal um, completion over 100 principal questionnaires last year we had 105 and almost 90 uh, teacher to complete the teacher questionnaire which is fantastic because that means for a good chunk of our sample we have information on their school environment um, their school behavior and their school attainment so if, if there are any teachers listening that completed the questionnaire we do really really appreciate it um, and we will be continuing to gather this data for throughout the study because it gives us that extra bit of information that helps us tell about helps tell us about the educational context rather than just the home context or what the parent experience is at home. So I just want to talk you through really two um, results of two studies that have been conducted with the data that's been collected so far. So this first one was led by uh, Dr. Kate Simpson, who is a lecturer within the Autism Centre of Excellence. And she presented this at ASFAR in 2016, and it's a, been a paper that's been submitted to a really good journal, which is Childcare, Health and Development. Now you can see her poster here when she presented it at ASFAR, but I'll talk you through, you're not expected to, to read that. So she looked at the questionnaire that we've administered to parents. And that questionnaire asks the parents what activity the child participates in at home, in the community and at school. And it's the one I was describing earlier. It asks how frequently the child engage in all these activities and how involved they are. It's actually quite a complex questionnaire because it then goes on to ask parents if they would like their child to be uh, changed, if they'd like to see any change in either the frequency or the involvement for children. So you end up with lots of, for each activity, so there's um, 10 activities for home, 6 for school I think and about 12 in the community, you end up with lots of information about current frequency, current involvement, desire for change in the frequency and desire for change involvement. But I'm just going to describe to you a little bit about the what parents said about how frequently and the children are involved and how they take part and how involved they are once they take part. So this question was really looking at this first element of uh, research questions I mentioned earlier, which is what does participation at school look like for children with autism? But I'm going to give you a bit of information about home and community as well so you can put this into context. So the children's home participation. So the highest level of frequency was uh, for in both the younger cohort and the old, older cohort was for indoor play and indoor games, watching TVs and DVDs and personal care. And most of these, the average for both the younger cohort and the older cohort was that these happen daily. I think that's understandable. We, you know, we, when we all think through our day, that makes sense. Interestingly, the lowest rated home activity was socializing using technology. Now this is absolutely understandable in a younger cohort. We didn't expect four to five year olds to be on Facebook or uh, Instagram 
um, but actually it was interesting that it was it was still low in the older cohort and there is some research actually saying that this um, socializing using technology is, is is a different experience for children with autism so I'll be really interested to see how that changes as the children who were 9 to 10 move into becoming teenagers and when we ask the parents about change they're they generally didn't mind on the frequency, but they wanted an increased diversity of activities. They would like their children to engage in a broader range of activities when at home. When the parents completed the information about community activities, the highest ratings that so the most frequently uh, attended activities were neighborhood outings and unstructured physical activities so that might just be going to a park or you know sort of um, not formal uh, structured physical activity but actually I was really struck by in both groups there was an average of less than once a month for getting together with other children uh, an average frequency of less than once a month for attending groups or clubs and an average um, frequency of less than once a month for organized physical activities so this means that on average children with autism are attending these kind of groups and clubs or organized physical activities or getting together with other children in an organized way less than once a month which I think we'd all agree would you know there must it would be interesting to look at the barriers which get in the way of children engaging in these activities um, so that we can help to problem solve if if it's uh, there, are, there are things in a way how can we help to make this change but what about the school activities what does participation in school look like for children with autism who were four to five years old and nine to ten year olds in 2015 in Australia so activities, so many of the activities like doing schoolwork and playing out in the um, at playtime were rated as happening every day that the child was at school. But actually the kind of optional activities were such as things like school teams and clubs and special roles, so like register monitor or um, class, you know, X. These were really rarely reported. In fact, less than once a week for um, the, the mean score was well under once a uh, sorry well under once a month. So what I, we went to the literature and looked at um, a study of children without ID and a study of children with ID. ID being intellectual and developmental disability, and the rates in that sample were a lot higher than we were than we found for children with autism so this is really interesting to us and because we want to know a little bit more about why these roles are so low and all roles in school teams or clubs um, and what well we'll come on to that in a minute but what the impact of that might be and when we ask parents whether they'd like a change in these activities where the frequency of participation was low such as school teams and clubs and special roles one in five parents of the five-year-olds would have would like this to increase but almost one third of parents of a nine to ten year olds would like to see their children uh, having a greater frequency of participation in school teams and school clubs or having a special role so I think by the time the children get to nine to ten the parents are kind of feeling like this really should be occurring now and wondering why and whether there is a role or a team or a club their child can participate in so that was really striking for me uh, because that's a really different school experience. So this kind of leads us on, we're going to begin to think about how do we enable children with autism to participate more in school and look into the factors that may help or hinder some of the barriers um, as well as the facilitators. I'm really interested to know what the impact of this lower participation is over time because of course school isn't just about the academic attainment but also about the social element and the um, engagement in team sports or clubs and learning the skills that go along with that and then we have a PhD student uh, 
starting with us uh, in a couple of weeks who's going to look at this in a bit more detail and hopefully interview some children to find out if does this matter is this important to them would they like it to change or are they happy with the levels that they're currently at so let's kind of watch this space for this because I think the child's voice on there as well as the parents and the teachers is going to be fascinating to helping us know how best to move forward with intervention interestingly just to note we're also adding these same these school frequency questions uh, into the teachers questionnaire for this year to see if um, what the parents understand is happening and what the teachers understand is happening are the same because it may be of course that um, these things are happening but that parents don't know about them and they're not being reported So the second study, um, I just wanted to describe it, we've had out of the LASA data really, is looking at the sorts of supports that children with autism access. Now, this was using the principal data. So we had 105 principals complete questionnaires, um, which is fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Um, and within that, there was 22 special schools. And the when we look at the funding, so about 70% of the principals were from public schools and we asked them a large number of questions but the ones I just wanted to summarize here are um, sort of what supports are provided for children with autism when they transition in and out of Australian schools and what supports are available to the teachers in the classes when the students with autism are included in their classes so what are they um, given above and beyond what they normally would receive because it's a child with autism in their class. So this is a, a complex graph so I'll talk you through it because it kind of makes your eyes um, go a bit fuzzy when you look at it. Okay so let's look at the key up here first. We've got the special schools um, in this kind of black check and the other schools in the smaller checks with the stars in. Okay and this is the percentage of people with principals reported that this strategy is used for children or offered for children when transitioning into foundation. So this wasn't particular to the child we were asking about. We were asking about is this a strategy that is um, provided in your school when transitioning into foundation. So this is a special school data here and this is did the child visit the school in the preceding year. So about 55% of children who had transitioned into a special school um, visited the preceding year. That means 45% of children probably hadn't been to that school um, or into that class before they started um, at the beginning of their first uh, term. And when we look at in the, the non-special schools, the mainstream schools, we've got about 82% um, offering this. So again that's about one in five children um, hadn't received this, hadn't visited in the preceding year. Um, it was about equal num between special schools and other schools where the staff from the early childhood centre gave a presentation before. So we're looking at nearly 30% there had presentations about the child. Um, oh, uh, we've got, oh sorry my slides are going everywhere. Um, here information collected from a previous setting nearly 80% of special schools did this and nearly 90% of other schools did this but again that's 20, 10 to 20% of children where no information was gathered before the child started. Um, staff visiting the early childhood centre so the new teachers visiting happened in about 60% of special schools, 70% of other schools when we asked how often staff from the school met with the early childhood centre to plan, that only happened in about half the cases of special schools and about three quarters of the cases of other schools. So again that's about 50% of special school and 25% of uh, other schools where this didn't happen. So the really striking ones for me were actually this is the difference between the special school and the mainstream school in the number of children who visited the preceding year but also in the number of schools that said that they don't offer any transition strategies. 
So we've got about 23% of special schools saying they don't offer transition strategies for children who are entering into foundation um, and comparing it to about 4% of the other schools. Now this is really interesting because you obviously we don't know how many uh, had uh, linked early childhood centres but actually we're seeing that special schools generally reported less transition to support before starting um, into foundation year and that made me wonder if you know because this is less less of an academic step to the child's first term perhaps it wasn't felt that transition strategies were needed but actually um, on reflection, still starting school, change of um, routine, change of everything is still very, um, very, can be very stressful and very unnerving and very unpredictable for children. Um, so, really thinking, we'd, I'd like to look into this a little bit more. Um, when the researcher who was looking through the data um, read the comments, uh, there was a lot of comments from schools that went from P to 12 that they didn't have transition between any transition strategies because, between primary and secondary because they were at the same school. And there was a sort of lack of recognition that a transition happens. Um, so this, uh, these participants were mainly Queensland, but they do come from all states across Australia. Um, I can have a look um, for the principal data um, and find out exactly what the split was but um, so this sort of lack of transition between every year the change of teacher the clan sort of really exploring what transition strategies happen year on year um, when we looked at the support in the classrooms um, available for mainstream teachers who had a child with autism within the class they lots of them noted they had um, access to support staff who have experience in special ed but when we asked them how many have had a opportunity to co-teach with a special ed teacher to gain their, from their knowledge and their experience actually very few had reported that and that's that's absolutely fine but I really felt well, that would be a really valuable opportunity for teacher PD and for teacher enhancement of knowledge of what a special ed teacher might bear in mind when teaching a class and I'd really like to find out a little bit more about when we have this whole range of strategies being offered, um, how they select, how the schools select which ones they're going to use. Do they have an evidence base they look at or do they say, well, for our children, this is what we offer? And how do they select which ones are needed for each child? Um, and is it from parental engagement and request? Um, who instigates that and how would they choose um, which ones are offered and which and find out if they were helpful or not so this has kind of ended up bringing up a lot more questions I guess um, as well as giving us a few answers and summary of the information just, just what is currently out there across these 105 schools so where are we going next with the transition and support so it would be great to find out what supports children continue to access throughout their education and the teachers who are completing the questionnaires for us have a, a, a questionnaire which asks about individual supports for children and then classroom supports and it would be interesting to see how many um, child specific supports are put in for children with autism accessing different schools then of course we'll begin to look at can these help to improve participation or attainment so is there better participation in the for the children schools for the children who have these kind of individualized rather than classroom wide strategies or do the classroom wide ones help everyone to participate and attain and again I'm really keen to get our PhD student to get the child's voice and think about what do the children think of the supports they receive and um, do they know they're there and do they think they're helpful so where are we going to next so um, as I said, the beauty of the longitudinal study is looking at change over time. So we will look at the data we have from time one and explore that in relation to time two. And also, so let's pretend this is participation in school at time one. Is the child doing the same at time two or has this changed? And what child, family or school factors influence the strength of this relationship? Which ones can improve it 
and which ones can to make this decline. And of course, then we can do that time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, time six. Um, and it starts to become very complex models, but really, really, really fascinating and important data. So of course, this wouldn't be possible without A, Robin, who's our brilliant um, project coordinator, and you'll see she's mentioned in many of these comments there for the parents, uh, but B, without our brilliant participants, uh, the parents spend, dedicate, and the teachers and the principals all dedicate time to completing these questionnaires. And I think um, when we read these comments and we get um, these things through, um, I just think it, it makes you realise it's all really worthwhile. And I particularly like this uh, question here, who the, freak, who the freak is the LASA research team? So um, I guess hopefully I've answered that for you today. I've answered what we're doing, um, where we're going with it, and really the, the joy and the benefit of having such a great data set to work with and the questions it can help us to answer, but also um, the additional questions it's bringing up for us so we can have uh, many more research projects going forwards. So that's uh, a brief overview. I'm more than happy to take questions now. Um, hopefully that has given you some, um, a bit of an overview of where we're at and where we're going. Thank you so much, Dawn. That was a really fantastic, informative and insightful overview of where the longitudinal study is at the moment and where it's heading, so thank you. Um, and certainly evidence of the tireless work that the team have done in pulling all of that research together um, and quite an extensive team as well, so congratulations and thank you. Um, I also, the thing that strikes me most when I think about um, the longitudinal studies um, that the CRC um, is working with, it really strikes me that that's 272 families who've actually let you and let our researchers into their lives and have shared their experiences quite openly. Um, and, and as you say, they've shared their thoughts and their experiences around social participation, educational engagement, um, behaviour, mental health development. Those are really, in some ways, very personal areas. Um, and also the families um, that have shared the principals that have let uh, the team into the schools and the teachers that have let the team into their classrooms. Um, if there's any of you listening to this webinar today, on behalf of the Autism CRC, we want to thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We join with that as well. It's, it's, I'm always um, admiring the time that everyone gives to complete the questionnaires and the extra comments they always put on there at the end as well, because we do read them um, and they're, they're brilliant at giving us additional insight. So thank you. Absolutely. So obviously there's an incredible wealth of information about all of these, these measures and um, this of course provides insights about what uh, supports may be beneficial for children on the spectrum in classrooms. I wonder at the moment what types of evidence-based supports can already help um, young people on the spectrum in their classrooms? So there's a whole range, well, as, as with every area of autism, there's a whole range of really good evidence-based strategies, but there's a broader range of strategies that aren't evidence-based, um, which we always worry that people are putting energy and time into um, using ones that may not have evidence to suggest they're helpful. Um, so for example, one of the really great ones is a, is visual supports. So that might be in the element of um, visual timetable or a visual schedule, but also in um, providing if if you know if children are older or higher functioning, agreed cues or um, signs symbols that can help remind of social rules and facilitate a sort of more positive engagement. Um, I was looking earlier for 
there's, there's, there are really good briefings if teachers want to look at whether strategies are evidence-based. Um, some being from Macquarie, the MUSEC, M-U-S-E-C briefings, give you a really one-page overview. Um, and what I like about those is that they give you ones that aren't evidence-based as well as ones that are. So if you come across something and you're not sure, you can look them up and they've got pretty much all you know all the strategies there um, and then they, they talk through some really nice ones that perhaps people aren't so aware of that do have evidence so peer relationship strategies um, which really help in social parts of school as well as the academic elements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. So another another question um, that comes to mind is really, you know, we spoke a lot about the, the role of um, parents, not parents, sorry, principals and teachers in sort of adding to the information that you have and the picture that you have of the students on the spectrum. How important is the relationship between parents and schools in successful outcomes for these children? So what we know from the research is that um, collaboration for child uh, around children with autism is essential in outcomes. So because because there's no one um, intervention that is the most helpful for autism because it is a spectrum and there are a range of interventions and inputs that can be helpful that differ for each child. There's no one person who has all the answers. So working collaboratively with teachers and home and any professionals that are involved is so important because no one person will be able to do everything to solve everything. And just as much as the teacher becomes the expert of the child at school, the, t the parents are the expert of the child outside of school. And often it's seen as um, he does this, no he doesn't. Actually you can begin to think out why is it different and you know see that as a way of going forwards rather than just you know feeling that it needs to be a point of disagreement. Actually it can be a point of agreement of what is different in the contexts. And um, yeah all the research shows the, that involving families at school has better outcomes and involving knowledge from school at home has better outcomes and um, it's not always easy to do either um, but uh, it's definitely uh, the best way forwards if people can engage from both sides. Absolutely in partnership is what I heard there Dawn how important it is yeah, that absolutely. parents and teachers are working together. Yeah exactly. Um, on that note, Dawn, can I ask, in your research and in your experience working with schools, how have you found the schools to be open to learning about how they could be more inclusive for children on the spectrum? Yeah, so um, Professor Roberts and uh, Dr Simpson in from our team did a review um, published a couple of years ago now looking at uh, what factors what teachers uh, and stakeholders perspectives on inclusion um, and they actually found that it was really clear across all the studies they reviewed that teachers and principals want to learn more um, about inclusion and want to do um, sort of positive strategies but actually finding helpful training resources was a big barrier for them. Um, and actually being able to get everyone on board within the school to do the, a strategy or um, introduce a new concept was actually one of the biggest barriers. So I think the desire um, is definitely there and the motivation is there, but actually knowing how to do it and how to monitor it um, is, is one of the barriers. So I think actually providing evidence-based information and support um, and open communication it, between all parties is the way forwards. Absolutely. Again, in partnership. Yeah, exactly. Partnership. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely um, a lot of application for this research in terms of practice, in terms of classrooms and teachers. It's really exciting to um, see the way that the, the team are already thinking about how those learnings can actually be put into programs, interventions, supports to really benefit children on the spectrum. Absolutely. So of course, 
A question from our audience, John. Are you able to measure the level of involvement in parents and successful outcomes or less successful outcomes? So the, the, the parents don't report on their own involvement, if, um, if, which would actually... <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to add in any more questions to a questionnaire, but the, the parents are reporting on the children's level involvement. Um, and I think that that's one thing we can look at and we will get the teachers ratings of the child's involvements. But how involved the parents are in school is not something we've got any information on. However, sort of going back to what we were just discussing, um, we do know that parents that get involved in school in a collaborative fashion. Um, have children with better outcomes and um, and are included in more elements of school and um, have the better engagement with school than parents who don't collaborate and that doesn't mean giving all your time to school and going over time but you know with email and communication now there's so many different ways you can collaborate with teachers and engage um, so you've got that partnership and two-way communication mm. Absolutely. So we might finish today's webinar right there. So thank you once again for joining us today and thank you so much Dawn for providing such a comprehensive overview of this study. Um, the, recording of the, <laughs> the recording of the webinar will be available on the Autism CRC website in the coming days. If you'd like to know more about the Autism CRC's work across the lifespan, please go to our website, Autism CRC, .com.au where you can sign up for our news, research updates and even participate in some of our studies. You can also follow us on social media. Thank you.